Transformer is arguably the most influential neural network architecture. In this video, you and I will go through how a transformer works and how various design choices are made. Hmm. Transformer is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. The original paper focuses on the machine translation problem, converting text from one language to another. If we open up the box of a transformer, we see encoders that process the input text sequence and decoders to produce the output tokens one at a time. We start with a spatial identifier, let's call it the star token. The decoders then predict the probability distributions of the next token. We sample the next token based on this probability and feed it back to the decoder. We repeat this process and stop after sampling a special stop token. We call this autoregressive models. Let's first look at how we represent the input text sequence. We break them down into pieces and call them tokens. Each token has a unique ID. This is known as tokenization. A simple way to represent tokens is to use one hard encoding. We associate each token with a vector of length equal to the number of unique tokens or vocabulary size. Only one single element in the vector is one, the rest are zeros. This vector representation is nice, but it does not encode any semantic meanings of words. It would be great to arrange these tokens as vectors in a space where semantically similar tokens are close to each other. This is the idea of token embedding. We can achieve this by learning an embedding matrix. This embedding matrix maps a one-half vector to a d-dimensional vector. Effectively, this matrix is a lookup table where each token's embedding is stored as a column vector. But many words have different meanings in different contexts. For example, apple may mean the fruit or the name of a tech company. We need to rely on context to resolve the ambiguity. Alright, let's see how we can encode the contextual information from a sentence with an encoder. Given a sequence of tokens, we apply the token embedding matrix to get the embedded tokens. The encoder's job is to convert this group of input vectors into a group of output vectors with contextual information. First, we can add a feed-forward network, usually a multi-layer perceptron, to extract more complex features from the input token embedding. But this itself won't work because we do not encode any contextual information. How about concatenating nearby token embeddings and feeding them to the MLP? This helps a bit, but we need a sufficiently large window. For example, the word orange at the end of a sentence could help us disambiguate the meaning of apple in this sentence. Perhaps we can make the window to cover the entire input sequence. Theoretically, this strategy encodes the context we want, but cannot handle variable input sequence lengths and has many model parameters. This is where the attention mechanism comes in. Let's use a toy example to get some intuition. If we see orange as a relevant token in the sentence, we can update the feature vector for the token apple so that it is semantically closer to fruit. If we see watch instead, we update the feature vector so that it's more associated with tech products like phones and laptops. Let's first use token similarity to determine the relevance. We can measure the similarity between tokens using vector dot products. These two are similar, and these two are not similar. Let's call these token embeddings x1 to x5. We measure the similarity between the token apple and another token with vector dot product. We do so for every token in the input sequence, including itself. The problem with vector dot products is that they can have negative values, and it's hard to imagine what a negative relevance means. A popular way to fix this is to apply an exponential function to make them positive and normalize them so that they sum up to 1. This is also called a softmax function. With these relevance weights, we can compute and update the features using a weighted average of these embeddings. Visually, we can imagine the embedding for the word apple gets pulled toward the word watch after this step. But the similarity between tokens is a very narrow form of relevance. Here, the adjective delicious is highly relevant to the word apple, 
but the token embeddings may be quite different. The concept of relevance is also asymmetrical. For the word delicious, the word apple is probably not as relevant. Therefore, we compute the relevance using vector dot product in a transform space. To extract the context for the token apple, we first compute the query vector Q4 and all the key vectors K1 to K5 using learnable weights WQ and WK. These metrics are part of the three model parameters that can be learned during training. We can then compute the relevance using vector dot product followed by softmax normalization. But instead of using token embedding itself, we compute the value vectors by learning the weight matrix WV. This provides more flexibility in extracting meaningful contextual information for the task. We can compute the updated features with context using a weighted average of these value vectors. In practice, the dimensionality of the value vector dv is smaller than that of the embedding vector d. To ensure that the output feature vectors have the same dimensionality, we use a learnable matrix wo to transform the dv dimension vector back to d dimension. Intuitively, you can view the multiplication of these two matrices, wo and wv, as the low rent approximation of the actual value matrix. Similarly, to extract the context for the token bot, we first compute the query vector Q2, the vector dot products with all the key vectors, and get the updated features using a weighted sum of the value vectors. Let's organize these computations. Here we have the vector dot products between the first query vector Q1 and all the key vectors. We can write this more compactly by stacking the key vectors into a matrix and stacking the query vectors along the columns. The original paper found that it's important to scale the dot product by 1 over square root of dk before applying the softmax. Why do we choose this particular scalar? Hmm. Assuming the components are random variables with zero mean and univariance, the vector dot product between the vector k and q has a variance dk. We call this matrix q, k, a, and a plum. Similarly, we can write the output features compactly in matrix representation. Here I use column vector representation for token features because I found it's more intuitive when we talk about linear transformation as matrix vector multiplication. This is known as single head attention because there's only one set of query, key, and value. But there are many different types of relevance in a sequence we wish the model to capture. We first introduce multiple linear projection matrices that form different representation subspaces. We apply the attention mechanism on each set, concatenate them, and produce the final output with another learned linear projection, WO. This is the design of multi-head attention. Great, we now have an effective method for extracting contextual information from the input sequence. Next, we use a feed forward model to further extract more complex features. The feed forward model is just a simple two-layer MLP that processes the feature at each position independently. But something seems a bit off. The self-attention computation is permutationally invariant. This means that the set of output features for the sentence, I bought an Apple Watch, and the sentence, watch an Apple I bought, is identical up to a permutation. To fix this, we need to provide our model with information about where the words are in the input sequence. This is called positional encoding. Here is a simple position encoding method proposed by the original paper. Our goal here is to come up with a unique vector, one for each position in the sequence. These vectors need to be the exact size of the embedded tokens so we can easily add them up. How do we design such vectors? Let's look at binary encoding to get some intuition. We encode these 16 numbers with 4 bits. This means that we can uniquely represent each number using a 4-dimensional vector. Looking at each dimension closely, we see that this one is fast oscillating, changing values with each position increment. In contrast, this dimension is slowly oscillating, and other dimensions are somewhere in between. 
With this intuition, we can design the positional encoding to have periodic signals like sines and cosines with low to fast oscillating angular frequencies. The number n is a hyperparameter that should be much larger than the position used for sinusoidal positional encoding, or the authors set it to 100,000. The sinusoidal positional encoding has a number of advantages. First, it has a normalized range between minus 1 to 1. Second, it has a unique identifier for each position, even for positions larger than the one used in training. Third, for any pair of relative positions, we can find a linear transformation between them. Here is how. We can express the position k plus delta k as the linear transform of the encoding of for the position k. We can express the position k plus delta k as the linear transform of the encoding for the position k. Theoretically, this allows the transformer to take any encoded position and find the encoding for the positions n steps ahead or n steps behind by matrix multiplication. Designing an effective positional encoding method is still an active research topic. Besides sinusoidal positional encoding, we also have relative positional encoding, Kerpo, Nope, Rope, Yarn, Cope, and Fire. We'll talk about this in more detail in a future video. Alright, so we inject the positional information into the embedded token by simple addition. We can easily stack these encoders to build a deeper model. But this poses significant challenges for training. For example, the gradient magnitude may become too small to update the model parameters effectively. To improve the training, we first add residual connections. These residual connections create shortcuts in the computational graph and allow gradients to flow more directly and smoothly through the network. We also add layer normalization that helps alleviate the vanishing gradient problem and the need for a careful initialization. The layer normalization normalizes inputs across its channel dimension and introduces learnable parameters for scaling and shifting the normalized input. The original paper applies the normalization after the residual blocks. As the gradient magnitudes are large for parameters near the output of each block, training this model requires a carefully designed learning rate warm-up stage. By moving the layer normalization inside the residual block, we get a well-behaved gradient at initialization and can train the model without a warm-up stage. With residual connections and layer normalization, we can effectively train a deeper network by stacking multiple encoders. We still have one feature vector for each position, but the features after the encoders fully capture the rich contextual information in the input sequence. We are now ready to discuss the decoders. We start with a special token to kick off the process. Like the encoders, we also use a stack of decoder blocks conditioned on the encoded features. At the end of the decoding blocks, we predict the probability distribution over all possible tokens. We then generate output tokens one at a time by sampling from the predicted distribution. The design of a decoder block is similar to that of an encoder. First, we also have multi-head attention for capturing the contextual information of the sequence. The attention module allows every position to attend over all positions. But because we generate the output tokens autoregressively, we need to restrict the model from attending to future positions. We call this mask attention and can implement it by adding a mask where the lower triangle has negative infinite values. This ensures that after the softmax function, these entries become zeros. Another bonus of mask attention is that we can create multiple training examples for a single target sequence. Like the decoder, we also have a residual connection, normalization, a position-wise feedforward network. The main difference is that we need to pass down the information from the encoder to the decoder. We achieve this by an encoder-decoder attention block. Similar to the attention mechanism we discussed, we compute the query vector by a learned linear transformation. But we compute the key vectors using the features of the encoder and compute the attention weights. We then produce the outputs using weighted combinations of the value vectors. 
This is known as cross attention or encoder decoder attention. This summarizes the three different types of computation in a decoder block. We stack the decoder blocks, a linear layer, and a softmax function for predicting the probability of the next token. This type of architecture is called encoder decoder transformer. Examples include the original transformer, T5, and BOT. They are good for machine translation and summarization tasks. This design works well when the input and target sequence are sufficiently different. We can also use encoder-only models. A representative model family is BERT. These methods are good at understanding the input text and have applications in classification, clustering, sequence tagging, and sentiment analysis. However, it is not designed for text generation. Decoder-only models, on the other hand, focus on text generation. Examples include the GPT series from OpenAI, Palm from Google, Llama family from Meta, and Broom from Big Science, to name a few. It's interesting to compare encoder-decoder models with decoder models. The encoder-decoder models have a clear separation of input and target sequences. The decoder-only models just append the input and target as a long sequence. It's flexible to steer the model responses using prompting and in-context examples, and therefore suitable for more general purpose applications. So next time when you look at a complex evolution tree of large language model like this, hopefully you have a good understanding of these models. Please let me know if you have questions in the comment section. Thanks for your attention, and I will see you next time.